Hi. Uh, good morning, um, Android people. So I just want to remind you that we have a, a, a sequence of presentations on AOSP today, so I hope you find them all interesting. So following from Anna talking about building embedded, uh, sorry, building Android, uh, embedded Android systems, the good and the bad. Uh, there is Amit Pundir uh, talking about uh, dev boards and Android. Uh, then at 11 o'clock, there's me talking about the Android build systems. And then crucially, after lunch uh, at uh, 1400, we have the BOF. I hope you all come along to the BOF because I want lots of contributions from everybody for that. Um, and then uh, just before the closing game at 1650 or something, um, we have Chris Haynes from Memfault talking about debugging and logging Android systems in the field. So a lot of fun stuff. I hope you enjoyed all. Uh, so good morning and welcome back. Uh, the first talk of the day we have with Anna Lena, uh, building embedded systems with AOSP. Over to you, Lan. So thank you. Um, nice to be here today. I think the most of you um, come from the site building embedded systems with uh, classical Linux. Today I want to take you with me uh, um, in the embedded Android world. I want to tell you a bit about uh, why you should consider using AOSP for building embedded systems in some cases and why not and share some of my personal best practices and pitfalls when doing so. But first, some words uh, about me. I'm Anna, I'm an embedded system dev at Innovex. Um, my most uh, important topics are Linux kernel, embedded systems with Yocto, and embedded Android. Um, oh, cool. I have a background in computer science and embedded systems and because I'm not a fan of the most hardware people, I start studying it myself so I can uh, do even better. And so let's have a look on how we can build systems with uh, AOSP. I've put some pictures of actual products running with AOSP with me. Um, uh, rather they build from people in my company or uh, from myself. The first one is a picture of a German e-reader that's, oh, what a mess, that's running with Android. Um, the second one is a security camera um, where the whole ecosystem is open for different vendors and the uh, base platform is built on based of the ASP and the second, uh, the third one is a car diagnosis system which also is uh, built on top of the AOSP. But I don't want to go more deep in that, it's just uh, an example for you on how AOSP is actually used in real life, it's, it's not just uh, something I tell you here. There are actually products out there where the ASP is used um, beside phones. But so yeah, let's start with uh, why you should, should consider AOSP for embedded systems and a small introduction in the AOSP wordings and some backgrounds. Um, something to the wording first. I probably will mess around with Android and AOSP in this talk. Um, the, the actual name is the Android Open Source Project, AOSP, and there's a small but important difference between AOSP and Android, because when talking about Android, um, it mostly means the certified Android, you have to pass some test suites and certification and so on um, to call your product Android compatible, um, even if it's mostly uh, nevertheless the case. And if you want to ship the Google um, Play services to make it real, real Android, you have to pay some additional license fees. Um, and the Android system itself is, as you might know, based on the Linux kernel 
with a completely um, whole, uh, completely new engineered um, user land from Google with a lot of abstraction layers, uh, a complete hardware abstraction layer, system services, and uh, the, mostly the best of it, the app runtime. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of layers. We don't want to target this here. But I want to say um, some few words about kernel. Um, Android always had an issue with uh, keeping the Linux kernel up to date, shipping the updates uh, to the manufacturers, sh them shipping them to the actual phones. It was really a mess. It's not really maintainable uh, the way it was. Currently, Android is pushing the generic kernel image approach. So the idea is having one kernel image shared between all phones, all Android devices, with pretty well-defined interfaces for manufacturers um, to put their external kernel modules uh, on. So the generic kernel image can be updated standalone and the dependencies uh, are intended to not to break between kernel updates. Um, but this is just a side note, as the most of you probably um, rather interested in the kernel world. So let's go to the things Android is good at and what uh, gives you really a plus when using Android. Um, let's start with a systems engineer's perspective. When using the AOSP as a base platform for your product, you get a really nice, proven, stable, and really solid engineered open source platform, um, which is based on Linux. You get this really nice, secure um, runtime for untrusted apps on top. You have a uh, a really good graphics, video, and media support. I know the most of you are aware on the situation with media and graphics and all this in Linux. It's always a bit hairy. Android is much easier when using this. And the same for the connectivity stack. You get Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC. All of this is uh, even an issue in the desktop Linux systems. I think Bluetooth is uh, a mess on my laptop for years. Android is on this point very well tested. Um, it runs mostly smoothly out of the box. That's really something nice to have. Um, as I said, you have the generic kernel image and lots of well-defined abstraction layers in uh, all places uh, at a kernel between kernel and the system as the HAL, the hardware abstraction layers, um, between the system uh, and the actual app side, between the apps, um, so the Android API. You get uh, a real nice support for different target devices, such as um, different target device classes, like um, phones, tablets, cars, um, watches, whatever Google is currently pushing. And you get um, some kind of power FNG and power optimization out of the box too. Yes. Uh, AOSP is big. It's it's not that optimized than you can do with a microcontroller and ultra low power um, whatever. But uh, for some things, uh, the optimization is really um, better than when starting with a bare uh, Linux embedded system. Then let's go further to the security perspective. Um, on a system level, Android is already um, stuffed with a lot of things that are, that are basically no cost for you when to start. 
as a Linux is already there and in place with pretty nice defaults. Um, yes, it's a mess if you have to uh, work with it and if you want to integrate your own stuff, but that's always with us Linux. Um, you have ASAN and a lot of uh, other sanitizers already in there and enabling them for the build time is basically no cost. I think it's uh, one configuration you have to change to use them. The Inverity is already there and mostly enabled per default. Um, Android is enforcing. Um, you have a hardware key store, uh, for example, Trust Zone or implementations of the ARM Trust Zone in there. And you already get a nice APIs to work with them on top. And the uh, over the air update mechanism is already built in the system. Um, no, the server is not. You have to provide your own server. Um, keep your server up to date, maintaining it. And uh, still have to test your updates, but the client side mechanism is uh, already there and really bomb proof. And some uh, rather not that cool parts with the read only file system are. Um, there is a good engineering too. On the app level, um, you have the really, really nice app concept, um, which has a secure runtime for untrusted um, apps in different levels. So uh, there are different uh, levels if you have a system app, if you have a vendor app, or if you have a third party or even instant apps. That's different classes with different rights and different levels of isolation and security. And it's pretty well sandboxed. Um, so if you really want the app concept, uh, this is really one of the plus sides. And if you want to have a look on your app developers and users, they're mostly really happy when uh, you choose Android. Um, on the user side, the app concept, UI concept is already known um, worldwide. So people um, mostly have no issues with uh, actually using your apps on the device. And uh, you have uh, the whole world of Android developers that already know the base ecosystem with the standard APIs. Um, there are lots of well-maintained and really good third-party libraries and even the uh, Android provided libraries. Um, most of them are really good documented in depth. And yes, you have a lot, uh, a large ecosystem of libraries, um, already existing apps, and you have really a lot of Android app developers, much more than you have uh, for Qt, uh, for other embedded uh, graphics frameworks. But there are also downsides when using the AOSP. And let's go to the pain points of the AOSP itself. Um, one is the code size. When you do a rare uh, AOSP source code checkout, it's uh, easy, around 200 gigabytes of source code only or more. If you start building it and have built intermediates lying around, um, one AOSP tree um, gets around 500 gigabytes really fast. So if you have one or more or three uh, ASP um, trees to maintain, you really need lots of SSD space. And you really want to have really potent uh, build hardware. Um, it's, it's not fun to build the AOSP. It, it takes hours, really hours. Um, and the same, um, the the system requirements on the target side are high too. So if you have pretty limited hardware, um, 
the ASP is may not for you. And when starting with the ASP development from a, a system engineer's point of view, um, it's, it's a mess, it's not really well documented, it's a really steep learning curve um, to navigate in the system with lots of the layers and the abstractions within the system. Google is constantly morphing uh, around in the system um, beside the APIs. Nothing is left untouched, mostly um, between the releases. The build system is uh, its a point itself. I think Chris can tell you more uh, about later. Um, but Google um, mostly likes to ship a new build system with new Android release. And this makes um, version updates rather painful. But I'm sure Chris will tell you more about this. And let's go further to the pains of Google, SOC vendors and OEMs. Um, one important thing, even is the AOSP branded as open source, it's not really open uh, as Linux is. You can download a source, you can work with it, you can build your own products based on it, but it's not really open to contribute. It's not completely impossible, but it's rather hard and uh, it's not a way you can influence the way uh, AOSP evolves. Um, it's completely controlled by Google. And yeah, if you want to brand your product uh, as Android, you have to do this whole um, Compati compatibility um, things and require a certification from Google. And the, the whole process with partner ecosystem license agreements is not really transparent and easy to go. And in general, um, SOC vendors, OEMs and Google are not really interested in helping you if you don't um, do phones or really supported the devices they want to push. Um, none of them is interested in selling rather low or medium quantity products. Um, if, we, if you want help for your use case, don't expect anything of them. Uh, helping you. And as a last point on this slide, but I think I have even more on it, um, is the BSPs. If you uh, want to build your own product um, based on uh, AOSP, you get a BSP from a SOC vendor and the quality is really varying between the vendors. It's it's not uh, fun every time, but I have a bit more on this later. Um, let's have a look at the general downsides first. Um, Google is focusing on certain types of devices. Currently, it's mostly phones, tablets, um, a bit rear and cars. Everything else, if you have a, a headless use case, it's not really supported in the Android system. So may you fi uh, have to find hacks around if you want to build uh, a product uh, with a headless use case. Um, as said, it's intended for large volume products and especially if you want to build your own uh, ecosystem then it's nice, if not, uh, not that much. Um, if you want to do OTAS, uh, what's pretty much rec uh, recommended, um, you need to run your own server and manage it. And in general, um, you have a large number of app developers, but really view AOSP system engineers available and mostly when building a product, you need lots of them. So um, that's a bit uh, 
a minus on this. But yeah, um, when is the AOSP nevertheless a good choice and why not? Um, I would recommend you using the AOSP if you want to build a whole ecosystem. For example, um, you want to uh, support various devices, maybe from different vendors. Um, if you want, uh, want to run on different hardware targets, different um, classes of devices, for example, phones, um, cars, whatever. Um, if you want uh, to make uh, usage of the really nice app concept and really want uh, to, to instrument this a lot, then AOSP is really nice. If you uh, make a clear advantage of the UI concept, it's cool. Um, the same for the media framework. If you have a use case that uh, uses extensively media um, communication and, and so on, then Android is may worth considering for you. And a bit not that uh, decisive, decisive point um, if you need a GPL free system layer. But I won't uh, decide for Android just because of the GPL part. And on the other side, don't use the ASP if your uh, use case has not a, a clear advantage of using it. So, for example, if you don't care about graphics and media at all, and the app concept is not needed for you because you have only one app running, then AOSP is pretty much not the right thing for you to use. If you're really in a performance sensitive context, if you may have to run um, even real-time tasks, the AOSP is not for you. It's just not um, manufactured for this. Um, if you have a really small use case, for example, only one or two apps running, um, the overhead you get with the AOSP is much too much uh, for the things you uh, get on the cost side. And if you don't have the person power and the, the number of engineers really well trained with AOSP system engineering, I would not recommend you to start a project with AOSP because um, there's no really support. There are no, not much uh, forums. There is no, no general community support there. But if that's not the case for you, you may can consider using the SP. And when you want to get started with it, I have some uh, general tips and tricks for you. The first one um, when starting, I think it's pretty much the same uh, with uh, Linux. Um, use the source, read the source. Um, there are things that may help you, for example, um, code search engines like codesearch.android.com. Uh, um, in the past, there were even more uh, third-party code, uh, code search engines, but I think they're all gone now. Um, but code search is really nice and fine to work with. Um, besides, you can um, generate uh, Android Studio project out of um, the AOSP sources. I've listed you how to do it. Um, for me, it always worked pretty much fine. A colleague just told me uh, it did not work for him at all. was a bit uh, strange, but I had no time to investigate in this. And there are some pro points if you use the AOSP tree in Android Studio you get um, the, the general features of Android Studio on top. Mostly they're intended for Java um, debugging and Java uh, 
development, but the most of it is available for native uh, sources as well. For example, it helps you with type information, find usages, um, syntax highlighting and auto-completion. Um, it's really comfortable if you want to execute tests in the uh, Android Studio project. For example, if you have uh, Gradle build files for your tests too, then it's uh, possible to run the tests directly in the IDE. That's really nice and sweet. And if you have uh, the AOSP source imported as a um, project in the IDE, you are able to attach the debugger directly um, from Android Studio to the system process, which makes debugging really nice. Um, but there's no general support for building the ASP from inside the ASP. But uh, for the rest, it's really helpful. Um, if you want to start, you need to select some point, some board to start with. Um, mostly the question is between starting with a phone, tablet, a dev board or the emulator. Um, mostly I would recommend starting with a phone from Google because they are um, available, they are not really cheap but well supported. Um, using the emulator is pretty much cheap, um, also available, but uh, depending on what you want to do, it does not behave exactly like real hardware, but uh, for most cases it's fine too. Um, dev boards is mostly an issue, currently most of them are not available anymore. Sometimes even the ones Google pushes and supports are um, out of sync in the tree and not really well maintained anymore. Um, in general, the av availability is still an issue. Um, if you want to use a reference board from a third party um, OEM, you have uh, also the av available issues and you have to deal with the OEM things too. Um, OEMs tend to make their BSP um, a bit different. Um, they, they have hacks in the build system and so on. So it's, it's always a bit of a mess to deal with uh, vendor branded uh, AOSP BSPs. Um, I have a list on this. If you want to start, I mostly would recommend starting with the vanilla AOSP supported by Google. It's uh, the standard way of working. It works as documented. Um, all versions are um, in general available, but uh, on the downside, it's not really suitable to build products with it because the hardware Google supports in there is uh, in common not available for you um, as a third party uh, vendor to build your products with it. And the dev boards supported are not a good option for production, but it's great to start with. Um, when dealing with brand vendor branded BSPs, um, the BSPs are supported by the vendor, they're pro brought to you by the vendor. Um, they're often filled with strange build scripts and work completely different um, than the standard. Sometimes they're really slow. Maybe uh, um, Chris says a bit on this vendor build things uh, too, I'm not sure. But uh, this is the only option, the only real option if you want to build your own products, then you have to deal with this side. And in this part I want to mention um, this really nice graphic from Karim Yakmo, um, which makes a bit uh, the point 
value placed in all of this uh, mess. So um, as a third party, people not working um, at a BSP vendor uh, or at Google, you're completely outside and um, you have to deal with all the mess you get. On the tools and platform uh, and workflow side, I really recommend you using Garrett Code Review. Of course, it's possible to build the AOSP um, with GitLab, GitHub, whatever in background, but uh, as it's a multi-repo project, it really uh, tends to get a mess. Garrett is intended to handle uh, multi-repo pro uh, projects. It enforces um, a really clear way of working and forces uh, well-formatted, nice commit messages. It has a proper handling of cross-repo commits. So yes, it's really ugly. It's hard to learn to work with Garrett, but please use it. It makes your life um, pretty much easier. Then um, pretty, uh, please use continuous integration or container setup. What you use is uh, in general not that important than using it. Uh, container are needed because uh, the AOSP tends to behave uh, a bit weird on different platforms, different host systems and you make it much easier for your developer if you have a container set up ready um, for them to start. And I think we don't uh, have to um, talk about why needing a, a CI anymore. It reduces uh, risks at merging um, in such a large project and ASP uh, a lot. But I want to uh, tell you what is, um, from my point of view, really needed in your CI uh, pipeline. Um, one thing is building for all the targets you support. Um, the next is check for the code style. If you allow different code styles in such a big project, it's get a mess. And the next point, the most important one, is testing and a lot of tests. If you can do it, uh, have tests on real hardware integrated in your CI pipeline. If not, use virtual or emulated devices. Um, use the available test suites in Android. Um, enhance it, uh, do your own ones, and in general, write lots of tests, really lots of tests. And as a last point, um, Android has a real nice uh, emulator supported, the Android Virtual Devices. It's based on QEMU and it's really easy to make a emulator configuration that matches your real device as good as possible. It allows you um, much faster round trip times in development it's really easy to handle within the CIs. Um, you can switch around with Android API uh, and general Android versions much, much easier than when um, working um, with real hardware. And it's portable, it's home office friendly. You don't have to uh, uh, put your five, dev boards with you every time and it's really nice if you don't get uh, enough real test hardware from your uh, um, from your clients so you have to share the hardware between developers so um, parts of it can use the emulator in general um, AVDs do not replace uh, the need for testing and developing on real hardware but they can help you a bit and speed up the development. So, thank you. Time for questions.
Any questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, do you have any experience with using Lineage.js as a base for getting started with Android development or maybe porting it to or uh, supporting new devices? What? I, I didn't understand uh, the name of it. Lineage.js. What? Lineage. Oh. Yeah. Um, no, we currently did not start with Lineage.js. But I think um, as it's based on the ASP2, it's not much a different. Yeah, um, yeah. You mentioned uh, you mentioned Java uh, in in your your talk about uh, which development uh, tools are available and, and integration and so on. But I had the well. Um, I developed a lot for Android in the Android 3, Android 4 days, but these days I hear that uh, Kotlin is very important. Um, so how well is Kotlin supported in the Android Studio and tooling and so on? Kotlin in general is very well supported, but on the system side, Kotlin does not really play uh, any role uh, currently. The system side is mostly Java still yet. Okay. Uh, if there are, aren't any questions? Oh. Hi, uh, Anna. Um, so, talking about emulators, you were talking about uh, the uh, the AVDs and the Goldfish emulator. Uh, do you have any experience with uh, Cuttlefish and CVDs? The person next to you knows about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, so the follow-on from that is, is is that in my experience, the CVDs are better for uh, CI. That than uh, AVDs. It's just that's what they're designed for. Um, I think I personally use the AVDs more, but uh, we are experiences uh, with cuttlefish too. Um, just ask Florian. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you, Anna, for the talk. And yeah. Thanks. Thanks.